Thank you for being with us tonight for the third appointment of Eternal Misunderstanding, the digital series of talk dedicated to Chen Zen exhibition, Short Circuits. Uh, tonight, we have our guests, uh, Davide Quadro and Wang Xing, discuss about the subject of spirituality and its misunderstanding as cosmotechnics. Davide Quadrio is an art historian and curator who spent most of his working life between China and Europe. And Wang Xing is a curator based in New York. And tonight they will examine the concept of spirituality, starting from the work of Chen Zhen and his generation and arriving until recent uh, artists and production. So I'm very happy to give them the word and Thank you for being with us again. Thank you. Hello, Wang Xing. I'm always so delighted to be talking with you. It's not the first time that we encounter. And uh, it seems that we are always getting into very hot topics of misunderstandings and um, prejudices and complications that we like to analyze. Um, for, for the occasion, um, I got this painting on my side that is going to accompany us, you know, throughout your presentation, um, which is a, a painting by Jam San uh, that is called Total Transformation of the Buddha and is actually a female Buddha, a female Pusa um, uh, in Chinese or uh, Bodhisattva is actually a Tara, but it's a robotic Tara. So, it's, a, it's an interesting take of you know, tradition into um, the contemporary and the future, actually. So um, without further ado, I think that Wang Xing will bring us through um, some aspects of cosmology um, that is actually uh, some, that it, in the tension of this cosmology between um, a sort of general Western tradition, and uh, in particular China. Of course, there is not an Orion, and there is not a West, per se. There are many Wests, and there are many Easts. Um, and I think that um, part of what we are uh, talking today will also bring into the conversation a sort of a resetting or renaming, you know, if you want to say it in a Confucianist way, you know, try to do the gemming, you know, like to 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 to, to rectify the name sometimes, um, and uh, I think it's interesting that we start from Chen Zheng to go really farther out of that, but to see also how Chen Zheng has been an inspiration, but also somehow is something that is in a tradition, but is also in the tech in the technique in the techniques, you know, of how um, China is been dealing with technology versus religion, technology versus rituals, and nature versus, versus human, nature versus tools. So um, I hope that I, I gave justice to what, um, what we are about to talk, talk and I let one thing just to lead now the conversation. And I will interfere um, maybe exactly to try to maybe reconnect some of the topics that one thing is gonna uh, bring us through but uh, just to um, comment on that and just to eventually clarify or to create an you know sort of vocabulary on alphabet that actually makes sense for people for you that are listening to, you know, to us talking and I will conclude with some comments and also some um, maybe some questions you want to see. So thank you very much to be with us again. I'm very happy. Thank you, Davide. It was a wonderful introduction and uh, almost impossible task to summarize <laughs> what we're about to go into. But I, I think it will be a wonderful roller coaster of ideas and um, clashes and discussions. Um, and thank you also to Giovanna and Davide again for inviting me. Um, and a uh, special thanks to our colleague Franco here who will help me navigate the PowerPoint. Um, and as he pulls the PowerPoint up, I want to quickly uh, introduce myself. I'm an art historian and curator based in New York. Um, I'm currently doing my PhD at NYU, the, art, uh, the Institute of Fine Arts. Um, 
actually focusing on Soviet hauntology in postmodern art, uh, and also working also working as a John Tisch teaching fellow at the Whitney Museum, where I've been giving a lot of um, talks like this, um, incidentally. Um, and I also am currently planning an exhibition that explores Asian futurism that um, wonderfully ties into some of the topics we're going into today. Um, so after some discussions uh, with Davide, we decided to um, theme this talk, Spirituality as Cosmo Techniques. And then while I was finalizing it yesterday, I, I realized it, it's, it's very important and potent to add the notion of misunderstanding um, to uh, the context of spirituality in which we're uh, unfolding our discussion today. Um, and I think what's interesting for um, kind of opening this conversation in, in tandem with Chen Zhen's work is that um, this is a kind of a perpetuating and abiding theme in his own work and his own thinking as well. And as Davide had mentioned earlier, frequently it falls into a kind of exoticized, simplified um, framework um, under this kind of east-west dichotomy. But I think what's fascinating and, and, and noteworthy is how spirituality has continued to be very potent and very present in contemporary life, in contemporary geopolitics, um, in contemporary art making. Um, so I think today's talk will touch upon quite a few examples, both from Chen Zhen's time and in, um, you know, artists who are from generations after him, as well as non-Chinese artists who are, I think, responding or making use of certain aspects of spirituality, um, the kind of associated uh, ritualistic and... Um, performative elements of that um, and understanding in kind of the myriad ways in which spirituality continues to micromanage our relationship to the world. Um, and I also want to quickly uh, mention the, the concept of Cosmo Techniques, which might be unfamiliar uh, for some of the audience, um, but this is a concept uh, coined by the philosopher Yu Kui who primarily writes on the philosophy of technology. Um, and he defines cosmo techniques as a unification of the moral and cosmos um, in uh, technical activities, which he defines as art making and craft making. And here he's tapping into the ancient Greek uh, notion of, techni of technique um, that kind of embeds in it meanings of art, craft, and technology. And I find that interesting and useful because it immediately dissolves some of the longstanding uh, contradictions or dichotomies that people may have taken for granted, you know, art, fine art and craft, um, art or culture versus technology. And Cosmo Techniques, for me, I think is a very useful tool to then break down um, some of these tired boundaries and dichotomies. And the work I'm illustrating on the right um, I'll go into more details later on in the talk, but I thought it's a wonderful um, illustration to start. This is a screen capture of the app view of a game designed by the Chinese American artist Ian Chun, uh, in which each player or user or audience to his work, which had a gallery component, um, can create and craft different offerings to this AI uh, generated um, God or deity um, called Bob, bag of ideas. Um, and we will go into more details later on. So well, I suspend you um, on the notion of what it is. Um, Franco, would you mind moving into the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, but to start with Chen Zhen, I thought it would be meaningful to connect it briefly to the exhibition at Hangar Bukoka. There's, I, under, I haven't been to the show, but I, based on what I've seen on the internet and from the website, um, there is a large scale installation that belongs to the same series, Jue Chang, which can be translated as, you know, a swan song. Uh, but this is one of the earliest iterations of it with the subtitle 50 strokes to each. And I'm showing you an installation at the 1998 Venice Biennial. Um, as you can probably tell from the, from the distinct uh, architectural background. Um, 
And for those of you who are already familiar with the structure of the Jiuchang installations, this is basically a large scale uh, um, structure uh, with different ready-made parts conjoined and then mutated into a percussion instrument so you can uh, play on the drum-like surfaces. But the constituent parts are drawn from daily life. So you can see that there are some bed frames, there are um, very well-worn chairs um, that are suspended and pieced together. And in this particular installation, there are also a variety of objects that audience are invited to pick up and use to um, attack and make sounds on these drum-like surfaces. Um, and these objects range from wooden sticks to police uh, uh, clubs um, to fragments of uh, weapons and ammunition. Um, so it's really um, loaded variety of objects that people can pick up and create their own sound, which then, as you can imagine, um, augment into a certain cacophony. And in this work, there is a layered um, reference and uh, or even direct response to the ongoing political unrest in the Middle East. And so the artist almost conceived of the work as a ritualistic healing. Uh, or resolution of that conflict. What I find particularly funny was that um, the ritual involves both, um, you know, the drumming um, and the creation of this acoustic and ritualistic dimension, but at the same time, it's also inviting the audience to activate or reenact acts of violence, you know, picking up these objects that you can use to hurt people. Um, and Tying this back to uh, notions of religion, spirituality, and cosmo techniques, um, we can infer plenty from the title. You know, 50 strokes to each um, is often evoked in vernacular language with Buddhist roots um, as a way to resolve conflict, so that, you know, 50 strokes to each party um, involved in a conflict, um, in a way, the the, the responsibility and blame were equally distributed. And at the same time, there's a different aspect to the work um, that you can see in the image on the right. The artist invited uh, Tibetan lamas um, to perform um, at various um, iterations of his Jiuchang installations, um, which is slightly different from the participatory um, component where the audience can uh, become part of the work. Uh, by introducing maybe a higher spiritual dimension um, and, and grounding the work or foregrounding the, maybe the healing or the aspirational aspect of the work. Um, can we move to the next slide, please? Franco, can we go to the next slide? moving to the next slide. Hmm. Tavi, do you have any comments <laughs> while we wait for the slides? <laughs> yes, um, I think it's interesting what you said about, uh, there is a the first question that always uh, intrigues me, right? That is much easier to talk about spirituality um, than to be, to talk about religion, you know? Mm -hmm. And there are aspects of these works that actually are religious in the nature and in also mechanism, you know, of activations. In the case of this particular Church Hang um, installation, it's also interesting to see how it's been installed and in different sort of situations, and also activated in different ways. Right? So you've been mentioning the collaboration, let's say, um, with the public, but also, you know, like being performed at um, a sort of conscious um, composition, you know, with the religious um, uh, lamas, right? The, the Buddhist lamas uh, from Tibet, or Tibetan Buddhists. Um, but also, I remember that I saw one of uh, the version of it in Shanghai, um, and actually the activation was very much more a sort of a, 
entertainment show with drummers, right? That it became <laughs> somehow it was shifting as well. Yeah. The beginning of the of the whole um, of the whole installation. Um, so just quickly, I think you know before we go on with uh, with uh, uh, with the rest of the presentation, I think it's interesting to for me to ask you, you know, how do you, do you think we can consider you know in the cosmo in the cosmo mechanics, let's say. Uh, this idea of religiosity, religiosity versus spirituality, you know, um, if, if it's actually, uh, <laughs> I know, I know it's a complicated Grand question. Exactly. Um, but, but I think it, it's very important that you highlighted that difference um, because it is a culturally specific difference um, in that I think Buddhism and Taoism are often practiced um, in general, more as a philosophical discourse and sometimes combined with ritual and vernacular beliefs and um, sometimes activities of superstition. Um, and, and so it manifests differently in different cultures. Um, so I think that's why I think perhaps spirituality is a more appropriate term for us to use, but yes, there are frequently elements uh, pertinent to very specific religious practices and religious um, iconography and precedents and stories. And also um, creation, right? Yeah, so. yeah. Um, but I think it is, um, the reason I, I, I thought about Huang Yongping in connection to Chen Zhen's piece and uh, Chen Zhen uh, both being Chinese artists who immigrated to France in the 1980s, having come out of um, this sort of avant-garde movement, having been educated in, uh, you know, art academy in China. Uh, but more importantly, the connection between these two pieces, Jiechang and the Three Steps, Nine Footprints, um, in which I, I, I see both artists in their newfound positions uh, between languages, between cultures, uh, a very fraught but also fruitful and strategic position both of them made use of um, and 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 seeing both artists almost using religion and spirituality as a metaphor and a comment on world affairs so Jie Chang, um as you probably remember was created in response to the conflict in the Middle East and this piece created by Huang Yongping in 1995 was um, almost in the direct aftermath of a series of bombings in Paris, terrorist attacks in Paris that are frequently embedded in these trash cans on, on the street. Um, and um, before I go into the meaning of the work, I think it's um, important to uh, articulate the different um, aspects and components of the work. Um, this is another installation. I'm showing an installation view on the left and then the artist drawing and um, almost a, a uh, sketch or uh, schema on, on the right. Um, so this is the installation that is covered on the floor level uh, with plaster, uh, very um, impressionable and fragile material. Um, and you can relate to that as a, a kind of materialization of the human condition. And then suspended from the ceiling, we have a agricultural tool looking um, device um, with three feet uh, or models of the feet attached to each end. And the, each one of these refers to one of the world's main religions. So there's Buddhism, there's um, Islam and Christianity. And the feet or the imprint uh, refers to um, the main uh, figure from each of these religions, with, which is, I think, fraught and rich in its own history of um, imaging uh, in terms of this you know religious iconography and theological understanding so essential essentially Huang Yongping is using this device of the three religions and the connotative um, reference to uh, the conflict and development or so-called evolution that's attached to these most powerful religions as they stamp and walk um, on across the earth or the plaster of, of humanity and 
creating a flurry of footprints, sometimes crisscrossing and other times just leaving permanent marks or clear marks um, of what that particular foot uh, responds to. And here you can see a little bit of the Dadaist and Duchampian influence because the foot for Jesus Christ was directly inspired by a ready-made by Duchamp. You can see it. Um, I don't know if you could see that, uh, see my cursor, but uh, in the middle of the illustration and the sketch by the artist, you can see that feet. Oh, thank you, Franco, for moving the cursor up. Um, and, and, and this is, I think, the reason I, I wanted to show these two works juxtaposed is also to perhaps illustrate the point that sometimes we understand um, a non-Western artist, a Chinese one perhaps, uh, when they make use of or make reference to uh, traditional religious or cultural um, aspects, um, it, it's, it's primarily used to interpret their work um, and then limiting their work into who they were. Um, but in both of these examples, you can see them using um, almost calibrating where they came from culturally um, as a way to comment on the world um, and comment on what is happening beyond their immediate scope, but at the same time using very specific um, visual um, and philosophical devices that, that's unique. Um, and then let's move to the next slide where I want to again highlight um, the kind of charged, sometimes impossible positions uh, that artists like Chen Zhen and Huang Yunping inhabited throughout their careers. Um, but thinking of it strategically and, and with quite a bit of wisdom. So Huang Yunping uh, famously said after he moved to Paris that he his favorite strategy is to attack the East with the West and attack the West with the East. Um, and by which I think he meant when he was you know making works while he was in China, um, you know, as a young artist, art student and artist absorbing the newfound uh, uh, flurry of translated texts of Western um, uh, philosophy, art, aesthetics, postmodernism. He was making a lot of works that might be visually and formally similar to his non-Chinese counterparts. But when he moved abroad, and you can see this in a lot of diasporic Chinese artists, um, they suddenly realized that a lot of the pre-modern um, and not so contemporary elements from their culture can be reactivated um, in very powerful ways. Um, but that kind of, um, but, but at the same time, they have to deal with the burden of existing in the kind of dichotomy in the perception of their works, this kind of East-West, modern, pre-modern, etc. Um, to which I think Huang Yunping had a brilliant response um, in this work titled um, The History of Chinese Painting and the History of Modern Western Art Washed in the Washing Machine for Two Minutes, a work that he first created in 1987 and then recreated in 1993. And the creative process of the work is exactly what um, the title implied. Um, and I thought it was also a brilliant and prescient uh, response to the cultural debate unfolding uh, during the avant-garde uh, moment in China, the 85 new wave and the reading fever, there were a lot of parallels being drawn between you know, what uh, the agency of Chinese artists, what they should do and uh, how they uh, can absorb and from and compete with um, this uh, both Western canon and, and their active counterparts. Uh, working together. And, and, uh, and of course, there's a lot of talk about melding or combining the two cultures. Um, and Huang Yunping's response to that was that you essentially would make two perfectly coherent and legible discourses and produce a bunch of pulp, uh, which is nonsensical um, and, and also completely devoid of meaning. But in that gesture, um, there is an embedded and, and profound critique of that impulse to uh, rationally perhaps combine um, these pretty impossible um, systems of knowledge and culture and, and beliefs and ways of art making. And that misunderstanding has continued to, um, I think, loom um, in, in the so-called global age. Um, and I think this work might be similar in 
spirit to Camille and Rose Gross Fatigue, which premiered, I think premiered, um, or at least was one of the star pieces of the 2013 Venice Biennial. Um, it was inspired by the artist residency at the Smithsonian Institute, um, this massive archive of human knowledge um, organized and chronicled uh, according to various epistemological systems and um, a, a kind of witty and emotional response to, to the weightiness indeed of human knowledge and um, the impulse or the charge to disentangle them to make sense of them and the result is a kind of uh, blocked and layered uh, desktop windows that I think a lot of us um, can relate to in our own messy arrangement of our desktops and, and how those connections are sometimes um, made and activated in this organized chaos um, of ours, very active, activated and organized chaos of ours. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? I would like just to add a comment on this, just to clarify a bit um, some of what you just said in terms of um, 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 historical point of view. Uh, you are talking about Chen Zhen and Wang Yunping, who actually are the, the product of the first generation of the post Maoist moment um, that has been studying in, in, the, in the newly open, uh, reopened academy for instance, in China. And it was also the moment, as we were uh, saying, that um, books and uh, information about not um, socialist-inspired art, you know, hit China and got into, um, into be known, you know, to be seen, first and be known, <laughs> you know, in um, the cultural context in China. And I think um, I just wanted to just, you know, zoom a bit out of what you've been saying, just to give a bit of a context that um, Chen Zhen and Huayan Pin are the product of a, of a specific moment in time in China, and also the, the first generation of Chinese artists, you know, being abroad for, for a longer time, being in that kind of, you know, sort of situation of being um, in the critical um, position uh, of being in between cultures, you know, in between moments. And, you know, um, Yen Pei Ming is another one of the series of artists that have been, you know, somehow um, rediscovering um, uh, Europe in that sense and, and through France mainly. You know? So it's actually interesting that you, that, that you mentioned that uh, historically also because the next talk um, with Francisca um, Coach will be really on how this generation of artists, you know, and how it's been, this generation of artists entered somehow um, and been displayed um, uh, in a certain sense in uh, Europe and in the Americas in the 90s, you know, and how that actually created and um, a lot of misunderstandings, you know, not only within uh, the artistic community, but also um, within, you know, the the, the, the audience you know, that has been exposed to a certain kind of uh, Chinese contemporary art of the period. So I just wanted to just, um, you know, give a bit of a hint that we are in a particular moment um, of history, which is the 90s, and it's, of course, it's very important to uh, somehow, you know, like focus on that and understand that it was really uh, we are talking about 30 years ago already, almost, you know? um, more than 20 years for sure. So it, it, it's been a very specific moment of time uh, mm -hmm. of the development of the so-called international Chinese contemporary art as well. Yeah. So it's up to you now. Yeah. No, that's wonderful. And, and thank you for the kind of historical contextualization of that generation and, and uh, for bonding again the, the notion of misunderstanding. Speaking of which, I think the next slide, um, what we're looking at here, an example by Faith Ringgold, um, I think would really spice things up in terms of today's uh, discussion, um, particularly when we think about the activation or evocation of spirituality. Um, in very uh, pragmatic and very kind of timeful political moment. Um, 
So a little bit about the work first. Um, this is a, 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 a typical piece from Faith Ringel's Tonka series. Um, this is also from her feminist series. So what you're looking at is basically a hanging woven scroll, also with uh, painted traces on top of it, um, titled um, Of My Two Handicap. And so the vertically inscribed sentence, um, which you probably can't read on the screen, uh, refers to um, a famous saying that um, by uh, Shirley Chisholm, who commented that of my two handicaps, being uh, a woman uh, puts more obstacles on my path than being Black. Um, and I think from that, you can infer that uh, a lot of Faith Ringgold's um, uh, Tonka series and her practice in general reflected um, deeply um, her own experiences or navigating day-to-day -day life and politics as an African-American artist and as a female artist. Um, but what's striking, I think, for us is that she uh, appropriated the Tonka format, um, which she first encountered when she was traveling in Europe. Um, and for her, this was something that was just visually brand new to her. It was utterly unfamiliar and strange, but at the same time, powerful and beautiful. And she, connect, she connected um, these woven ritualistic and religious objects to um, craft making tradition in America, to, you know, woven objects and um, cloth making and quilts, um, which is something that we normally uh, would not uh, associate with, um, I guess, for people like Davide and myself. Um, and she also thought that this is such a radically new form to counter the very, uh, you know, straight male and white straight male dominant art field um, as she was entering, you know, in the 70s. And so she thought that, that this was visually and philosophically and conceptually um, a, a powerful way for her to um, ground and anchor um, her own experiences, even though this had come from a radically different cultural context. And I think we can definitely um, problematize this way of appropriation and, and how, uh, you know, equating um, an unfamiliar, um, unfamiliar as in unfamiliar to Western um, art makers or art practitioners, unfamiliar cultural um, objects and artifacts um, into under this rubric of craft, um, which has its own implications and hierarchical meaning, you know, within the art system. Um, but at the same time, um, I also find this kind of creative misuse and um, almost reactivation of um, a kind of historically um, solidified tradition of religiosity and spirituality. Um, kind of fascinating, um, and it transcends um, the familiar notion that perhaps only a, a Chinese artist or even a Tibetan artist can make a work as this. And this is not even a strictly speaking Tonka piece, right? Um, I think Davide can speak to this as well, um, because the painted part might remind you of a literati painting, a hanging scroll, and a kind of vertical inscription of poetic verses, and even the mounting of it might remind you of some of the Japanese uh, mounting techniques. So this is really um, a kind of Frankensteinian um, collage of um, various East Asian cultural traditions. Um, can we go to the next slide, please, where we'll see a, a drastically different kind of tanka um, made by a contemporary uh, Chinese artist, Zhao Yao, who was born in the 80s. So this is a different generation already. Um, but he's, I think, avocation of religion is both, um, I think, conceptual, um, a little bit ironic, uh, but sincere. Um, so this is a work um, that I'm showing you a really dramatic uh, view of. Um, this is a work titled Spirit of, of Above All. It's a continuous work that had different iterations, but what we're looking at now is um, perhaps the highlight um, of that process where the artist transported a 10,000 square meter fabric um, of, because she primarily made up of abstract patterns um, onto the hillside uh, of a sacred mountain in Qinghai, 
um, which is very close to the Tibet region um, and next to uh, a Buddhist monastery. And the unfurling of that tapestry also involved um, um, enlisting the help and blessings of the Lamas and local communities in, in the region. So even the unfurling of it was quite a ritual. David, do you want to add? Yeah, comment on that because I think it's a way to contextualize this. Um, in, the, um, in Qinghai is the, is the region that is in between, let's say, roughly between the Mongolian area, the culturally Mongolian area, the Hui area, which is the, um, let's say, the, the uh -huh. Muslim part, you know, of, um, of China, and then the geographical Tibet that actually has been, you know, it was ex much more extended um, historically as a culture um, through different regions in China. And one is the Qinghai province, um, uh, which is very large and uh, it's also the place where I I've been living in for a couple of years when I was studying. So wow. I'm familiar to this. Um, but um, I wanted just also to, 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 to explain Zhao Yao work from a ritual point of view, uh, mm -hmm. in the sense that um, uh, the display of this kind of huge um, clothes made um, let's say ritual objects at the end of the day or religious objects it's actually part of some of the festivities that um, um, tibetan um, tibetan uh, tibetan's monastery actually apply to mm -hmm. uh, usually they display on the mountains in in some uh, particular dates of the year and I, i'm thinking about the labra monastery for instance it's very famous they have actually part just opposite to the main buildings they have this um, hilltop, basically that, um, where basically they, uh, if I remember right, they display a, a, an amazing embroidered uh, tanka uh, that is a thousand of meters squared, I don't remember how many, how many meters squared, um, and it's displayed you know, for pilgrims and for the religious people, you know, in certain kind of days. So Jiao Yao is actually, again, kidnapping you know is sometimes <laughs> somehow um this concept and make it you know um as you were saying abstract um uh, you know in a in form but also be, you know somehow repeating this need for a ritual object that then is somehow sanctified you know with uh, as we can see in the image i think that um one of the lamas is blessing it right so it's also part of the ritualty related to that yeah, um, indeed. So can we move to the next slide where you can see that um, aspect, that ritualist, ritualistic aspect more clearly. Uh, what the artist did was to leave this uh, fabric on the hillside for an entire winter. Um, and this also gives you, I think, a better view of the abstract pattern. And that's where I meant the work is also a little bit ironic because the, if you think about the discourse of abstract art or this you know, high abstraction mid-century, there's a lot of religious and spiritual associations with that practice of abstract art. Um, so Jaya was tapping into that notion of spirituality as well. That's why the title is Spirit Above All, um, which is you know, quite humorous um, if you think about that in multiple contexts, both in this religious context, the kind of um, spiritualized abstract, abstract, Western abstraction, I mean, context, and um, in the kind of secular and communist context yes. of China. But when we, when we talk about the philosophy um, and isms of communist leaders, we also use spirit, right? Like in, in Chinese, we, we do, there's, a, a very interesting um, messiness to to the language um, that I think is powerful in 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 everyday cultural practice um, and in propaganda and and, and um, ideologies too. Um, and indeed, as Davide has mentioned earlier, um, this is borrowing also that kind of shodan festival where a large tanka, usually beautifully embroidered has to be laid um, on the side of a hill so that it can both be cleansed and exposed to sunlight. It's kind of a conservation effort, but at the same time, it's a, a very ritualistic um, moment where you see the Buddha, the Buddha 
um, directly reacting to the natural environment. And sometimes there's a notion of, you know, the light hitting the, the Buddha as you unfurl the, the Tanka. Um, but at the same time, you might be reminded of, you know, land art practices, this kind of monumental scale um, of works that seem to speak to a cosmic audience, um, which again can be tied to, you know, early, earlier Buddhist practices of in, inscribing large uh, texts on mountain size, particularly in moments when um, Buddhist practitioners considered that the end of their belief is coming. So they need to leave as many traces as possible and as large and as durable as possible. Um, so I, I think this is a really important and fascinating work to anchor all of those uh, notions and concepts floating around but not committing to any one of them. It's, it's, I think it's fascinating precisely because they're activated and sometimes in conflict. Um, if I will say one thing more about this work is that the artist later transported that to the worker stadium in Beijing. Um, and um, unfurled it there in a in a very communal and communist um, context. Um, so you can see this tanka um, transforming and, and mutating through these contexts and generating some new meaning each time. Um, can we move to the next slide, please? Mm -hmm. um, and here was the work I started my slides with, uh, Nian Chan's Bob bag of beliefs, um, which the artist defined as the first in a new series of artificial life forms who takes the form of a chimeric um, branching serpent. Um, and here, all of these images are taken by myself. Um, this is the gallery view, and these two were screenshots. And to recap what the work was about, when you enter the gallery, you see a screen with a kind of a live feed on the right um, that tells you so-and-so or whatever user or worshiper submitted um, um, an object to an offering. And you can see uh, their names also dropped from the, the top. And we have this dragon-like but um, multi-headed creature um, kind of moving about and sometimes jumping up to snatch one of these um, usernames, supposedly when an offering was deemed satisfactory. And when you're seeing from you know, the app side, when you download um, the work and browsing through it um, and engaging with Bob um, themselves, um, you will get a notification that you know, your offering has been collected. And you'll also notice that at the bottom here, there's a, um, um, a control panel for your offering um, with all kinds of absurd um, variables. So you can, I, I forgot the specific variables, but you can decide whether the, your offering is um, evil or benevolent, um, and there are different parameters. And um, it, it's a very fun and interactive work where it, it's a mutually molding and informing process that I think provides a fascinating metaphor for, you know, religious practice in general, because you are in, in essence, training your God, you're materializing your deity, you're giving it form, you're giving, um, you're basically giving uh, the theology to throughout generations of worshiping practice. But here, the speed of that process has been expedited because we have the scale of digital interaction. Um, I just thought it was incredibly um, telling that um, the, the figure and the shrine um, had a certain visual and aesthetic consideration to it. Um, so I thought it would be fascinating to bring in this context. I, we have comment on this, but I'm gonna do it at the end of it because I think it's um, a very interesting um, starting point for a question that relates to um, technology and spirituality. Yeah. Uh, in a context like Buddhist practice, for instance. But I, I would like to keep it, you know, for the end because I, I think we're gonna have fun in analyzing this. So Okay, go. that's that's fair. I think I have maybe uh four or five slides left and yeah. then we can have a conversation. Yeah. So can we go to the next one, please? Um, and, and here, I think we're moving further or, you know, in a similar direction where you see 
kind of a meta religious cosmology um, and the dynamic flow of a digital interaction. Um, in this case, also a video game created by the Shanghai based artist Lu Yang, The Great Adventure of Material Worlds. Um, here are two screenshots. Um, and to briefly recap, this is a game where you adopt um, the character of the material world knight, um, the figure on the left, um, a, a very manga and uh, video gamey character. Um, and you traverse through different realms that are defined primarily by Buddhist cosmology. So there's hell, there's heaven, uh, there's purgatory, there's bardo. There's also a realm where you face yourself and you have to fight yourself. Um, and so the structure of the game and the narrative flow was very much informed by a, 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 a very, I think, sincere um, uh, appropriation of Buddhist cosmology. Um, but when you look at these realms uh, visually, they're populated with pop imagery, they're populated with various um, different uh, religious and medical imagery. So the one on the left, for instance, has a Hindu god on top. And the one on the right, we have uh, Gandhara Bodhisattvas, as well as cranial medical objects that um, almost simulate the emanation of um, uh, kind of the halo from um, from deities and, and deified figures, um, where we have this um, mechanic uh, costumed uh, main figure flying across this universe. Um, and uh, throughout her, well, their journey um, through the material world, um, there's often a witty and um, humorous uh, monologue accompanying it. So this one is, you know, the material uh, world knight asking, is this hell? And there's another slide where um, the knight asks, okay, if I go to the heaven, will I have 72 virgins? Um, things like that. So a little bit like a chatbot and video game and a uh, um, comlograte of world religion. Um, I'm moving on to the next work. Slide, please. Um, I want to show two kind of vernacular examples. Um, so these are not artistic works, but I think they exist in the same uh, the same realm and the, the same kind of um, mentality and reception of uh, spirituality and technology um, as a coherent um, element uh, or practice. So on the left, um, it, there's a, the pre a Japanese Buddhist priest who specializes in blessing um, machines that had passed away. Um, and particularly uh, many of these machines were anthropomorph anthropomorphized or created in the shape of uh, animals um, to augment the kind of emotional connection or affective dimension of machines, which is a whole other uh, area we can go into um, intimately. Um, and also, you know, to our increasing reliance and uh, um, connection to digital objects, even for those without a concrete form. For those of you who may have played Animal Crossing at the beginning of the lockdown last year, I remember there were a whole series of articles where people felt uh, guilty after they um, harassed some of their animal uh, residents on their island in order to open up the space for more desirable um, animals. And these are all digital uh, and non-material uh, beings, and yet our relationship to them can feel incredibly real or just as real um, or, or more real than with other sentient beings. And on the right is a vernacular practice in Taiwan called Electric Techno Neon Gods, which has its own wiki, uh, Wikipedia entry, which uh, essentially combines a kind of local ritualistic dance and um, a kind of regional uh, religious practice with um, electronic music and embellishment of um, neon flashes. Um, so, you know, the, the, the end result is this fantastical um, and very alive um, uh, regional and vernacular practice that went viral online. Um, so moving on to the next work, 
we have an online, a very recent online exhibition that I'm showing you a screenshot of called The Beach, uh, the Peach uh, Spring uh, Beyond This World. Um, and uh, this evokes another familiar uh, trope of perhaps utopia um, in, uh, in a distinctly Chinese uh, way um, and culturally specific Chinese way. So the, the peach spring, uh, peach blossom spring um, it came from a, a fable, uh, a literary classic written in the fifth century, um, where a fisherman, you know, went wandered into a, a peach blossom spring, um, and discovered a parallel world um, that had withstood um, uh, calamities and wars, um, but was completely unaffected by it. So time evolved in parallel but differently. So people had not. Um, had no idea what the current dynasty was, what the current emperors were, and they were living in an utterly harmonized and utopic life. And the fishermen, upon learning this, decided to, you know, go back and maybe bring more people to it. But he would, after leaving the, the paradise, um, if you will, he could never return. Um, so this is a, a trope frequently evoked when we want to talk about, you know, utopia, when we want to talk about a certain escapism. Um, but it's also frequently... I think brought up in contemporary art practices um, in, uh, there's a work I'm not bringing in, but in the new classic of Mountains and Seas, a video work by Chiuan Xiu. In the third uh, video, the peach blossom spring um, is uh, portrayed as a hidden layer in a futuristic world, a kind of uh, a cyberpunk world. It's a hidden layer, um, again, a very gimified language that you can go into. Um, but has this historical tie to uh, this fifth century notion of what a peach blossom spring is. Um, and can we go into the next slide? And this is an exhibition of two artists, Atiao and Yefuna. Uh, both, I would say, are very active and making works in response to the digital space. Um, and in the previous slide, I think you already get a sense of the kind of um, beautiful, kitschy, uh, vibe um, of their general aesthetic approach. And here are kind of juxtaposed um, views if you go into each of their work. So Yefuna on the left created um, kind of an online Siri-like simulation, uh, Dr. Corona, where you can ask various questions and are sometimes provided with useful and other times nonsensical answers. So I, I asked, what is life last night? And this was the screenshot from that answer. And it doesn't um, answer the question at all. And in the background, you can see um, digitally modeled uh, um, virus um, uh, floating. And so all of these, when you look at them and experience the works online, they're, they're constantly in dynamic mutation. And on the right, Deep stim uh, Simulator uh, by Atiao. Um, according to the artist, this was directly tied to um, the state of Bardo or, you know, before, between death and uh, reincarnation, a kind of a purgatory-like situation you have to figure out and collect objects in order to come out of it. Um, and the arrangement and your digital experience with these works and these interfaces are also very, very disorienting. Um, so um, visual elements that you don't think could move are moving um, and, and places that you think could lead to something leads to something else. So that's the best summarization I can give you right now of these works. Um, but I think this is kind of a very telling example of that sort of cosmo-technical mentality at work and, and continuing to inform artistic practice that are also related to what we're going on collectively. Um, and now, finally, on to the last slide, I want to bring us back to Chenzhen again. Um, can we move to the last slide, please, Franco? Yes, um, this is um, Chenzhen's work, actually from the year he passed away on Village Sans Frontier, which can be translated as a village without borders. Um, and this is a work um, that were created in collaboration with, um, I think, Brazilian children when, when he was doing um, social work um, in South America. Um, and this is a series of, you know, ready-made installations that combined um, um, these candlestick uh, structures that he already had been working on from a year before, um, Beyond Vulnerability, 
um, you know, these beautiful and very fragile and burnable transient uh, objects now fixed into um, these tiny stools and children's uh, furniture um, to almost come up with a model of dream houses and ideal houses. Um, it's a very, I think, um, hopeful work in a lot of ways, but to me, there's always a poignant dimension to it because we know mortality and death looms large in throughout Chen Zhen's career. Um, and at the same time, when you look at these objects, they're playful, they're beautiful, they're precious, but they might also remind you of funerary objects, you know, these furnitures one make um, to go with one to the afterlife. And so I think that's a layer of spirituality that might not be religiously specific, uh, but culturally resonant and indeed universal. So I think on that note, I'll end and we can open our conversation. Perfect. Um, I really, um, I think it's beautiful how you brought us, you know, from a Chenzhen sort of um, Huan Yuanping uh, moment in time through very um, specific works that opens up actually the, this um, interesting um, connection between um, between spirituality, really religion, um, visuality, and new technology. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, when I talk about new technology, I don't talk about new technology of the now, but new technology as a concept, you know, of always pushing somehow farther or what an artist can do. And what I find fascinating, and that is for me always something that I, that I feel when I'm in Asia in general, um, is this um, natural um, understanding of technology not as something outside you, but actually as something that you can be using as a tool. And this is going to be actually my first um, <laughs> complicated question to you. And I would like to um, read something that um, a colleague uh, and a uh, a friend of mine, a sinologist, um, wrote on this very interesting article um, that is now available on the, on the 13 Gwangu Biennale, which is actually named um, Mind Rising and Spirits Tuning, very much on <laughs> what we are talking about now. And, and the question starts with a quote first, and then we can take it from that, you know, and because I find fascinating. Um, how um, Francesca Tarocco, actually the author of this text, brings um, what you brought and we actually we touched upon, you touched upon in several, uh, in different sort of realms um, just now. But it touched upon really to something that uh, connects immediately spirituality with technology in a such a um, natural, uh, uh, I can say, um, flexible and beautiful way. And um, the article is titled The Beams of Technology and Ritual Animation. And it really starts with that. It's a few, few sentences I would like to just read to you. In 2015, Lung Chuan Monastery in Beijing introduced Xian R, a diminutive robot monk that interacts with visitors. Mm -hmm. 2017, SoftBank Group, that Pepper, a robot priest that conducts Buddhist funerals. In 2019, the Tepo Kodai in Kyoto made history when its head priest enshrined the robot Mindar as a manifestation of the Bodhisattva canon or Gwenon. So and I can go on. And South Korea, Japan, and China uh, by to be leading innovators in technology. Some Buddhist practitioners appear to be deeply involved with contemporary discourses around technology that uh, do not bear the stamp of techno orientalism. So it's really we are really entering a new sort of phase, you know, um, in, in in considering what uh, and how technology and spirituality and religious are are bringing, you know, um, uh, not only sentient beings, you know, but also objects, as you were just said, about, you know, that, um, that, uh, that 
that objects that you know that are somehow shaped as human or animals, or video games where you actually interact you know with animals that actually become part of you. So this kind of consequent relationship between uh, um, it, it, I, I feel in Asia is a very striking between human beings, you know, and the spirituality and the, and, and the objects of technology and the medium of technology as well um, is of course becoming now uh, incredibly relevant when you when you see how um, new media is approached in such a casual way uh, in Asia and somehow in um, uh, in a much more natural way. So how do you, uh, natural in the sense that, it, it, you know, it's really this nonchalance of using the medium without trying to um, confuse a medium with an artwork itself, you know, which I find uh, very often in, in the Western context, you know, this sort of a um, vision of technology as something that is secret. You know, and somehow only because this technology it has a sort of a, a amazingness about that, right? And in Asia, is actually instrumental. You know, I, I always find um, from how I remember in the late nineties, you use um, DVDs, and then we use um, you know stuff that is actually in relationship with uh, new technology is actually used in a very casual way. So I, I think just answering this question will be, I think, a very beautiful end of this conversation. It's already like almost an hour that we talk. Um, so I let you give you give me, you know, your um, take on this. If it's not okay. I feel like I have the perfect answer to this because uh, that's why I'm smiling while you were framing it. Um, and I particularly appreciate how you um, use the term flexible and casual in that kind of relationship. Um, and it's, it's also incredibly pragmatic. And I think that that kind of pragmatism is what's keeping it so funny and alive and um, present. Um, the, the example I, that came up to my mind, I wasn't even thinking about this before the talk, was um, perfect illustrates the extent people um, go into um, in combining the spiritual or the superstitious with digital platforms. Um, knowing that, you know, this is an Italian institution and uh, I'm also a big soccer fan. And China is a big soccer country with a lot of, you know, Syria fans and supporters of the Italian team. I remember um, when Juventus had its last, one of its previous coaches, Massimiliano Arigri, and um, he wasn't, there was a moment when they were not winning. And on among the fans in the Chinese cyberspace on Weibo, you have people photoshopping his head into um, a Taoist uh, a Taoist image, you know, the kind of Taoist um, talisman you would place, um, you would burn at the end of a ritual, or you would place um, in popular, you know, Chinese zombie films, you place it on the forehead of the zombie so that it stops moving. So it has actual talismanic and magical powers. And so these people would make these elaborate um, digital talismans Taoist um, images with this Italian coach when they, uh, when Juventus fans want their team to win. And that just stuck in my mind for, for forever. I laughed uh, for days. Um, but at the same time, seriously, I think it does illustrate the point you were, you were making. And it always is so unexpected. And yet when it appears, you, you realize, of course, it makes sense. It makes perfect sense. Yes. So thank you very much, Martin, for all this. You know, you 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 created a journey that is unexpected, and it brought us to new territory exploration. So I let Giovanna just um, um, take this. Yes, to the it was uh, really amazing, and thank you very much. How how you could uh, really open up to. 
an overview starting from Shenzhen and going and going to to, to very contemporary and uh, and technology and and pop culture. Also, this last <laughs> answer of you really connected and really help us see the art of Shenzhen uh, as really uh, relevant uh, uh, as a starting point from for further generation of, of younger artists. And not only artists, I think it's it's much wider than just the art, but also uh, popular culture. And I think that really the title of his exhibition, Short Circuits, it's <laughs> coming on and on because uh, now uh, it's more clear, I think, to everyone looking at his exhibition, and I hope it will reopen soon, uh, how talking about Western, Western East uh, uh, today more than any time of, of, of our history, it makes uh, no sense whatsoever. We are a triangle between New York, Milan, and Marke, and as I was saying before, Davide, is still a Chinese curator, but is based in Italy, and so it's really interesting to look at these uh, at these connections uh, in, a, in a very new light. And thank you so much for being with us. And um, I hope uh, that uh, you will be able to travel physically to Milan <laughs> one day. Uh, yeah. And uh, thank you very much. And I wait uh, Davide and uh, our public for the next next appointment of uh, eternal misunderstanding that it's getting to be uh, oh, less and less misunderstanding. I think this, this kind of talks really help us to look at each other's cultures in a completely different and, and open light. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. It's been a pleasure. Talk to you soon. Thank you.